All right. So, uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, uh, Muted. I'm going to be talking about green computing or green IT. My uh, name is Sertaj Sani. I'm with the University of Florida. Uh, today's talk is going to be a very uh, introductory talk on this topic. And my purpose today really would be to just uh, introduce the term green computing, motivate it, explain why it's becoming an important uh, direction in computer science and engineering research today, uh, and uh, just give you uh, a, a few ideas of what computer scientists and engineers can do in this direction. Right before I start, I wanted to just uh, show you a picture of our campus here at the University in Gainesville. And uh, in front of, well, actually behind this tower, uh, you would see, uh, I guess right here, if you can see my cursor, uh, this is the uh, computer science uh, building out here. And if you walk through this uh, little opening out here and go to the back, then you will see the uh, characteristic of our building, which is this uh, sculpture out here, which is fondly known as French fries from hell, and it actually looks like giant French fries. <laughs> All right, now, if, if you think back over uh, the last, perhaps, uh, five decades of computing, we'll see that uh, at any instance in time, there has been some buzzword that has been uh, the rallying cry for much of the work that's being done. So uh, about five decades ago, everybody was talking about digital computing, where we were just making the shift from analog to digital. Of course, now nobody talks about or uses that particular buzzword. Uh, after that, we were talking about parallel computing. At that point in time, we didn't really take off and become popular, but uh, everybody was talking about it. It was uh, perhaps too expensive. But today, uh, parallel computing is being done by everybody, perhaps unknown to them, in, in, on their desktop computers or on their laptops. And nobody uh, is actually using that term to describe what they're doing. Personal computing, distributed computing, grid computing, cloud computing, and today uh, a relatively new buzzword, green computing, which is what uh, we want to talk about. And another buzzword that's trying to emerge, thermal computing, where people are concerned with uh, computing to control the temperature of the computing device. Uh, it becomes important when people are talking about wearable computing or uh, uh, computers being embedded into humans, you don't want the temperature of the uh, computer to become too excessive in those uh, conditions. All right, so let's uh, start by looking at a definition of green computing. Here's one that was uh, put forward by San Murugesan uh, about three, uh, three and a half years ago. And uh, if you look at this definition here, if you take out the things that are in green, then you get something that could be used as a definition of classical computing from before the time the buzzword green computing came around. So at that time, we were concerned primarily with uh, designing and using computers, servers, and associated subsystems efficiently and effectively. So we were concerned with uh, things like runtime and uh, space taken by <coughs> our systems or our programs. Uh, what green computing has done is added in more things to be concerned about. So uh, that's not just designing and using, but also manufacturing and disposing of computers once they're no longer in use. And uh, at the bottom of the paragraph, I've got this stuff about uh, the impact computing has on the environment. Okay. Now, let's elaborate on this a bit. All right, so how does what we do in the IT profession impact our environment? 
Right, computers run on energy, so certainly we've got the issue of energy we consume. Uh, when you consume energy, uh, there's carbon dioxide emissions resulting from the energy consumption and use process. <coughs> and uh, then, of course, uh, every three years we uh, get tired of the uh, current computer we have and we uh, uh, retire it and buy a new one. So what happens to uh, the computer that is being retired? Okay. All right, so <clears throat> uh, through the use of energy, and we'll see in a moment that the energy use isn't trivial, and through the retirement of used equipment, we do have an impact on the environment. <clears throat> At the same time, while these factors have contributed negatively, the availability of better computer tools optimizations resulting from computers has resulted in uh, a reduction in resources need, needed in applications. So for example, using computer technology Muted. design better airplanes, better buses, better engines, better trains, which use less energy than being used before, you can come up with better scheduling algorithms for <laughs> aircraft, for uh, shipping of supplies and equipment through networks resulting in a decrease in energy consumption in those processes. Okay. So uh, you, you, you have the negatives from the actual use of computers and you do have uh, the positives also from the actual use but resulting in better systems in other areas. <coughs> As I mentioned earlier, traditionally in our field, we've been concerned with building faster systems and uh, we've been concerned with what does it cost to buy this system and how fast typically can we uh, solve our application. Uh, we've been concerned with the amount of memory used only to the extent that the programs we write don't require more memory than available to us. Uh, <coughs> <clears throat> we typically don't uh, ask questions like, what is it going to cost us to operate this computer? Or what is it going to cost us three years down the road when we are retiring the computer and we want to get rid of it? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> if we look at the energy consumed by computers, say home computers, relative to uh, other things you may have in the home, we see that uh, personal computers actually account for a very small amount of the energy. So uh, uh, this one here, <coughs> uh, you're looking at uh, perhaps about a fifth of the energy taken by a refrigerator. Uh, so while on an individual basis the energy consumption is small relative to other appliances we have, on the other hand, uh, in some homes today you may have five of these five computers while you have only one refrigerator. So uh, if you take the energy per computer and multiply by a factor of five, you begin to see that you're competing with air conditioning and uh, refrigerators. <coughs> now if, if you're a large organization, say uh, you have of the order of 50,000 uh, PCs in your university or company, well then, uh, typically you're spending of the order of $2 billion a year just on the electricity. <coughs> uh, one could save uh, quite a bit of that if uh, one simply adopted a protocol where you shut off your computer at night if, when it was not being used. Of course, on my campus, on top of every uh, computer, we have a sign that says, please do not shut this computer off. <coughs> okay, so. The, the energy cost to a company just from its PCs could be fairly substantial. <clears throat> if you look at this uh, chart here, which shows uh, how the information communication and technology industry has been uh, increasing its use of energy, um, this, task, this chart is somewhat old. It's a five-year-old chart, but it's the latest one I was able to find. <coughs> Uh, if you look at it, you see that uh, in the information communication technology area, there is substantial energy being consumed by 
say routers, they're taking a large fraction of the overall energy. By business PCs, by servers. <coughs> you know, the share for routers is uh, actually the highest at this point and is getting to be a greater fraction of the overall energy consumed. <coughs> Interestingly, very few people even know what a router is. <coughs> so I have a few pictures here of routers. The gray routers here are Cisco routers. The uh, blue ones are from Juniper. Uh, so you can see routers come in all sizes. You have uh, routers that you may have at home which are small and which may run in cost of in the order of uh, 20 to $50. Dollars. You have big routers used uh, in the uh, network backbone, and uh, uh, these uh, may cost of the order of uh, several hundreds of thousands of dollars. The uh, <coughs> so what, what, what the, the purpose of a router is really to move packets through the network. So your internet service provider, for example, would have a fairly large router. Packets coming in to the service provider uh, would be examined by the router, for example, we would examine the destination address. And based upon the destination address of a packet, the router will design, decide where to send this packet to next. So it's a fairly simple operation, but it has to be done at a very high rate. So routers may in, in the backbone need to process several hundred million packets a second. Okay. <coughs> right, I have another, another chart here which just shows uh, the router energy consumed in Japan. And uh, uh, this is uh, about a two year old chart here. And the, what this chart shows is that here in blue, we have the uh, internet traffic, and internet traffic has been growing at 40% a year for the last several years. And uh, so the chart here projects that moving forward, it'll continue to grow at 40% a year. So right now, we're somewhere around here in this timeline. The red chart shows the uh, energy consumption, or the red line shows energy consumption by routers alone. And the energy consumption by routers is going up at about the same rate, 40% a year, to track the uh, growth internet traffic. <coughs> uh, what this chart indicates is that at the current rate of growth of energy consumption by routers, somewhere around 2025, the energy consumed by routers alone in Japan would uh, exceed the total power generated by Japan in the year 2005. Now one might say, well, that's not really very relevant because we're talking about energy consumed in 2025 versus energy produced in 2005. However, energy production isn't going up at the rate of 40% a year. It's going up more like 1% a year or so, which means that if it's not 2025, it's probably 2026 when uh, <coughs> the energy required to just run the routers would exceed the total energy being generated at that point in time. So <coughs> there is a significant need just in the router area to reduce the energy required by of the order of three to four orders of magnitude. So uh, by 1,000 to 10,000 fold. <coughs> if you look at energy used by data centers, <coughs> well, the energy used by data centers is also growing exponentially. <coughs> and we face similar problems down the road if we can't figure out how to reduce the energy being consumed by data centers. The pie chart here gives you a breakdown of energy consumption in data centers. And uh, what you see here is that less than half of the energy is actually being used by computers and associated equipment. The other half 
being used by uh, <coughs> uh, things like uh, heating and air conditioning. That's the biggest component of the other half, uh, lighting, losses, and so on. Okay. <coughs> now, in the data center area, uh, <coughs> uh, for example, uh, in uh, <coughs> uh, last year, data centers accounted for about 1.5% of the total electricity used in the U.S. And as I said, this usage is growing exponentially. The uh, estimate is that you could cut down the use of this energy by at least 50%, though uh, you probably could do a lot better than 50%. Okay. And some things that are being done, which really aren't uh, computer science, computer engineering, but I thought it interesting to know, one is to uh, build energy uh, data centers in areas where you would need less energy. So, for example, here uh, <coughs> in Louisville, Kentucky, this particular data center is being carved underground out of solid limestone and is expected to uh, <coughs> show an energy reduction in the heating and air conditioning components by about 28%. If you look at uh, data centers more closely, let's, for example, look at one of Google's data centers. Uh, it's not clear where this one is. Google tends to be somewhat secretive about uh, which data center they're talking about. <coughs> All right, this particular data center has 45,000 servers that are stored in 45 shipping containers. So you're looking at about 1,000 servers per container. Uh, each container is individually water-cooled. Uh, <coughs> Each server has its own UPS rather than using a centralized C uh, U uh, UPS, and this also contributes to saving in energy. <coughs> and for this particular data center, the uh, power utilization efficiency, which is defined to be the gross power divided by the power being used by the computers and networks in the center, is about 1.13 which is fairly good because for most of the uh, other or prior data centers, this ratio was two, meaning that about half of the energy was being used by the computers and network equipment and the other half by others, as we saw in the previous pie chart. Uh, Facebook has a uh, data center in Oregon, and uh, this one achieves an even better power utilization efficiency of about 1.07. So certainly uh, the non-computer science, computer engineering aspects of this, which is the HVAC and lighting and losses and stuff, those folks have figured out how to reduce their share of the energy consumption. So it's gone from being about half, a little more than half, to only about 7%. It really remains for uh, us as computer engineers and scientists to figure out how to reduce what we are consuming. <coughs> uh, if you look at uh, energy consumed by a single search, <coughs> well, a single search takes about uh, 3 over 10,000 kilowatt hours at uh, a nominal cost of cent 10 cents per kilowatt hour. This works out to about uh, 3,000 of a cent pretty cheap on a per search basis, but if you figure out that over a billion searches are being done a day, the energy cost of doing the searches alone is about three million dollars per day. So uh, <coughs> uh, you, you could figure out that Google's uh, electricity bill is fairly uh, substantial. At three million a day, you're looking at about a billion a year in electricity alone to run uh, Google searches. <laughs> the carbon dioxide from <coughs> these searches uh, isn't meager either. <coughs> uh, each Google search, the objective in, in designing how a search is done is to minimize the response time. And to minimize the response time, <coughs> uh, Google forks out the search to several competing servers 
and the first one that finishes gets to report its results. So there's a lot of redundant work being done in an effort to give you good response time, and that redundant work is contributing to this uh, substantial uh, carbon dioxide emission that takes place. <clears throat> if you compare it to uh, boiling a cup of water, one search consumes about or generates about half as much carbon dioxide as bo boiling a sum of water. <clears throat> as an industry, information communication technology is producing about 2% of the global CO2 emissions. All right, getting back to the definition, there are four dimensions for green computing, green IT. There is design, manufacturing, use, and disposal. You know, as computer scientists and engineers, we're not, say, directly involved in the manufacturing and the disposal process, but we are directly involved in the design and use process. <coughs> and so, uh, those are the two areas where we need to focus our attention. Uh, how can we help? Uh, certainly we can help in the design of computers, designing power efficient computer architectures. Uh, the uh, relationship between power consumed by a processor and the speed at which it's operating is, is is an interesting one. The power consumed lies somewhere or grows somewhere between the square of the speed and cube of the speed. So here I'm assuming a conservative square. If it's closer to cube, depending upon the operating range of the processor, it could be much closer to cube than to square. Well, then uh, the, the next slide becomes even more amplified. Now, if, if power is growing as square of the speed, <coughs> well then, if you have four processors running at half the speed, okay, so half the speed would mean one-fourth the power. So four processors consuming one-fourth the power would be the same power as a processor running at nominal speed. <coughs> but since your speed is half and you have four processors, you have the potential for two times the throughput. <coughs> so, so that's a very interesting observation, because what that tells you is <coughs> if you slowed down computers but instead had many of them, you could run potentially much faster, consuming much less energy. Okay. <coughs> and, and that observation really is the driving force behind the current trend in computer architecture, which is not to increase the speed of individual computers. In fact, the speed of an individual processor might even be lowered. But instead, to build many processors on a single chip, resulting in multi-core processors, <coughs> as well as the uh, current trend in using graphics processing units, GPUs, for general purpose computing. Okay. <coughs> the other bullet I'd highlighted, one was green design, so that has to do with the architecture, and there, uh, as we said, the emphasis is towards uh, multi-cores and GPUs. <coughs> the other one is use, and use would mean we need to take another look at our application codes and rewrite them so that the focus isn't necessarily on turnaround time, performance in, measured by time, but also performance measured by energy consumption. So we need to write codes that are consciously aware of the energy that code is going to take when it is run. As it turns out, <coughs> an energy aware code doesn't necessarily have to sacrifice runtime performance. You could get both an increase in runtime or no decrease in runtime and yet end up using less energy. <coughs> and to see why or how this may happen, uh, <clears throat> in, in traditional 
computing, certainly in the classroom, we focus a lot on counting arithmetic operations with the result that all of the codes we write tend to minimize the number of arithmetic operations. <clears throat> However, both the time and energy required to move data overshadows the time and energy required to perform the operations. So for example, <clears throat> if you're moving a 64-bit so if you're performing a 64-bit integer addition, then you need about one picojoule of energy. To do a 64-bit double precision operation, you need about 20 picojoules of energy. However, to <coughs> get the data required to perform that addition or double precision operation takes a lot more energy than this one picojoule or 20 picojoules. So to fetch one operand, a uh, one <coughs> data and the associated operator from memory that is say on the chip but very close to the processing unit say it's one millimeter away from the processing unit well that would take you 26 picojoules so that's already more than the energy required to perform a double precision arithmetic operation and it's 26 times what it would take you to do an integer operation. Okay. <clears throat> the same data, if it's coming from the other end of the chip, now you need one nanojoule just to get the data. Well, that one nanojoule is 1,000 times the energy required to perform a 64-bit integer add and 50 times the energy required to do the double precision operation. <clears throat> if you have to get the data from off chip memory, well then you're looking at 16 nanojoules and even for a double precision operation, the energy cost of moving the data is 1,000 times the cost of doing the operation. <clears throat> now that <clears throat> compares actually uh, fairly accurately with the time. If you're off chip, then you're trying to get it from main memory. If you're on chip, you may be getting it from a cache. And the cost, the time cost of moving data from memory to cache is about a thousand times the time required to do the operation itself. The time required to move data from cache to a register from where the operation is going to be done, well that may be of the order of uh, 10 times the time required to do the operation. Okay. All right, so <coughs> by designing algorithms so that they used data carefully in the sense that Data is used, uh, so data is brought from main memory to cache and is used in a temporal proximity manner so that while it's still in cache, you get maximum use out of it before it gets kicked out of cache and avoid having to re-bring the data from main memory. You save not only on the energy, but you save also on the runtime. Okay. <coughs> right. Now, if you look at some trends out here, the green curve shows the doubling of transistors per chip that happens every two years. So that's the famous Moore's law. And uh, <clears throat> in, in the past, the uh, growing uh, the growth in transistors allowed us to uh, increase clock speeds, increase uh, performance by using long instructions, by doing all kinds of branch predictions right on the chip. But somewhere around the year 2000, the trend in increasing clock speeds, the trend in increasing the performance per clock, and of course the accompanying increased power needed to drive the processor, 
uh, came to an end. It was uh, pretty much approximating the growth in transistors. And we ended a flat region where clock speeds remained the same and in some cases even dropped. The uh, performance per clock became stagnant and the power needed to drive these processes uh, stopped increasing as a result. Uh, the, the growth in transistors per chip, of course, continues to follow Moore's law, and the increased transistors today are being used to uh, increase the number of cores, processing cores, on a chip. The cores running at perhaps lower speeds than the fastest cores being built 10 years ago, but you have more of them. <coughs> All right, so this uh, <coughs> trend in building multi-core chips, putting more processing cores per chip, has uh, <coughs> had its impact both at the very high end of computers and at the low end of computers. So the very high end, if you look at uh, the fastest computers in the world today, <coughs> the uh, top five. The number one computer is uh, one that was uh, built earlier this year in Japan, the K computer. The number two computer is the Tiana 1A in China. There's one in the US and then another one in China and the fifth one's in Japan. <coughs> So the K computer and Jaguar all make use of multi-core processors. K computer using eight-core CPUs and the Jaguar using six-core CPUs. The other three make heavy use of GPUs, all of them using NVIDIA's GPUs. Um, if you look here at this column, <coughs> here it gives you the number of cores. So the K computer has about half a million cores in it, and uh, benchmarking using the Limpac performance benchmarks, the K computer is able to achieve about <coughs> eight petaflops per second, uh, which actually uh, exceeds the sum of the next four computers. The uh, power consumption is fairly substantial, so you've got about 10 megawatts of power required to drive this computer. It's not an insignificant amount. Uh, to get 10 megawatts, you probably have to build your own power plant outside that computing center. Okay, <coughs> so uh, <coughs> if you look at uh, the uh, performance per megawatt, so megaflops per second per watt used, the uh, Slowest of the five gives you the best performance. This one is the GPU-based one, but not best by a whole lot. At the top, you've got the K computer, which is very, very close. So <coughs> uh, regardless today whether you're going the uh, multi-core route or you're going the GPU route, you can, at least on linpack type benchmarks, get similar performance per watt. Just to get an idea of the uh, electric bills these folks are paying, assuming an energy cost of about 10 cents per uh, kilowatt hour, we see that uh, the K computer is running about uh, $9 million a year in energy, almost $1,000 an hour. <coughs> All right, a closer look at the K computer, we've got about half a million cores. Each core supports multi-threading, so if you want good performance, you need to have uh, two threads per core, <coughs> working out to a total of about a million cores. That means we, know, we need to know how to write programs that generate a million threads if we want to come anywhere near peak performance for this machine. If you look at the uh, number two computer, <coughs> which is GPU based, well the number two computer in its uh, 7,000 GPUs has a total of about 3 million cores. <coughs> to get this computer to give you performance anywhere near its peak performance, 
to keep those three million cores active all the time, you need about 30 million threads. So <clears throat> whether you're looking at the number one supercomputer or the number two supercomputer, to keep these fellows busy, we're talking about millions of threads needed. <clears throat> All right, so, so that takes programming to a whole different dimension from, say, programming a desktop computer today, which may have only like four cores, and you may need only about eight threads to keep those four cores active. <clears throat> All right, some other interesting statistics here to keep in mind. Say the bottom one here, that uh, if you plan on keeping your supercomputer for four to five years, of course, in four to five years, if you were the number one computer, you would probably drop out of the top 10 or top 20 in that period. <coughs> the uh, operating cost would come pretty close to the cost of buying that computer in the first place. So uh, operating cost is not a trivial amount, and you certainly need to keep that in mind when you're thinking about buying a computer. Similarly, if you're trying to uh, come up with the next uh, next greatest search engine and you want to displace Google, you have to keep in mind that you're going to have to pay a billion dollars in energy costs, let alone the costs in buying <coughs> all of the equipment, the servers needed to keep it going. So it's a fairly capital intensive industry. <coughs> and let's take a closer look at multi-cores. So, <coughs> if you look at uh, a single CPU, a multi-core CPU, uh, what you have on the market today <coughs> would vary from maybe dual cores, two cores, four cores, six cores, eight cores. You could probably even buy things around 100 cores. <coughs> but uh, in the affordable price range, people typically talking about uh, maybe up to six core CPUs. <coughs> the pictures I have here are for a four-core CPU. <coughs> so uh, the one on the left, the Intel Xeon, uh, in blue I have core zero, the yellow one is core one, then core two in red and core three in green. Each core has its own private L1 cache, but the four cores share an L2 cache and they share this off-chip memory which is much larger. At the other end we have the Intel Itanium which has uh, three levels of cache L1, L2, L3 and each core has its own private L1, L2, L3. The uh, availability of a shared core L2 cache here <coughs> and private caches here could have an impact on the design of algorithms for maximum efficiency. <coughs> Let's take a look at a very simple example of what it takes to go from a single core program to a multi-core program. Okay. So here we have a uh, matrix multiply code. <coughs> uh, this is written in a cache away fashion. If you've uh, been looking mainly at textbook codes, <coughs> then <coughs> the uh, textbook codes uh, <coughs> would uh, <coughs> have your for i loop and then here <coughs> in, in this inner loop is where I'm doing the actual computing so the uh <coughs> you have a 4k loop and a 4k j loop and you compute the product matrix C. <coughs> in the <coughs> traditional textbook version of this code you would have these bottom two loops interchanged. This would be the 4J loop and that would be the 4K loop. Uh, that version is not very cache friendly. Uh, this version here where uh, <coughs> I've inverted the two innermost loops from textbook codes is a very cache friendly code. <coughs> and if you run it on uh, modern computers, you'll find that this version runs about eight times faster than uh, the textbook code which has these two uh, for loops, the K and the J loops, interchanged. And that, of course, has to do with the cost of bringing data from off-chip memory to cache versus taking data from cache to a register to perform the arithmetic. The total arithmetic counts is exactly the same whether you keep this order of the for loops or you invert the K and the J loops. 
Again, bringing back the statement I made earlier, <coughs> that with current computers, the cost lies not in the operations, but the cost lies both in terms of energy and in terms of time in moving the data to the place where the operations are going to be done. And so we have to pay a lot of attention to where our data is sitting and ensuring that once data becomes close to the processing units, you use make maximum utilization of that data before <coughs> that data is kicked out of cache. <coughs> All right, so to go from that single core <coughs> code to a multi-core code, a, a common <coughs> approach would be to use <coughs> something called OpenMP, which is uh, <coughs> A, a way of uh, putting in compiler directives into your code so that the compiler can generate multi-core code for you. <coughs> so here I've just put in a simple uh, compiler directive which says uh, OMP parallel 4. <coughs> this tells the compiler that it can take the uh, for loop <coughs> immediately following the statement and chop it up <coughs> into components without fear of data dependency problems from code inside of the for loop. <clears throat> so this for loop, which is running from 0 to n, if you had eight threads, would be chopped up into eight parts with the, uh, so for example, if n is 800, then for i going from 0 to 99, so the first 100 iterations would be done on one core, the next hundred on another core, the next hundred on another core, and that splitting of this code <coughs> would be done automatically by the compiler. You don't have to rewrite the code yourself into eight separate <coughs> threads. <coughs> All right, so you can get a uh, multi-threaded version of our matrix multiply code fairly easily by just taking in this line in red. Now that may not necessarily give you the best multi-threaded version, but at least you'll get a version that is able to take advantage of a computer that supports eight threads, say. <clears throat> All right, so it doesn't take a whole lot of work. You can do better than this because com compilers aren't uh, necessarily as good as humans for certain types of uh, optimizations. <clears throat> and uh, with some more effort, you can get a code that perhaps runs a little bit faster than this simple uh, conversion. <coughs> Other things <coughs> in the multi-core area, <coughs> down the pipe, we would be able to control the speed at which different cores run. <coughs> and by controlling the speed of different cores, <coughs> we could reduce the total energy consumed without necessarily sacrificing the overall runtime. So for example, <coughs> here I'm showing a program that has four independent tasks at one stage in the computing. The first or the red task requires two units of time to complete. The two yellow ones require four units and the black task eight units. <coughs> we could run them on a four core CPU, assigning each task to one core. And uh, this block of computing would finish in eight time units. <coughs> the energy consumed, <coughs> we would uh, shut off the uh, red core after two time units, so it would take two units of energy, shut off the yellow cores after four time units, that would take four units of energy per yellow core, and shut off the black core when it terminates in eight units, using a total of 18 units of energy. <coughs> On the other hand, I could decide to slow down cores instead of shutting them off. So I could run the red core at one-fourth the speed and the yellow cores at half the speed. In that case, the red core at one-fourth the speed <coughs> would take one-sixteenth the energy, assuming a quadratic relationship between speed and energy. At the other extreme, it could be cubic, so instead of one over sixteen, it could be one over sixty-four. Okay. But being conservative, I'm using the one over sixteenth. The yellow cores would take one-fourth, and the black core would take its nominal rated energy for eight time units. <coughs> that would require a total of 12.5 units of energy versus 
the uh, previous scheme here, which was 18 units. So I can slow down cores to <coughs> reduce total energy, having, in this case, zero impact on throughput. Okay. So that brings a new dimension to writing algorithms. And that is uh, looking at tasks that can be run at the same time and figuring out the uh, optimal power or speed at which they should be run without affecting the overall runtime. <coughs> uh, brings about interesting scheduling issues. So for example, instead of four cores, you had two. How should you take these four tasks and schedule them on two cores so as to meet a target computing time with minimum energy? And there's a lot of research being done <coughs> in terms of scheduling complicated tasks to achieve performance goals in terms of time, but also performance goals in terms of energy. <coughs> uh, we can play the same thing with caches. Caches <coughs> consume a fair amount of energy. Cache designs down the road would allow you to shut off parts of the caches. That would increase the runtime, but would reduce the energy consumption. Increasing the runtime of a component of your application may not increase the overall performance of the application, just like in the previous case, we had four tasks. You could slow down some of the tasks and not affect overall runtime. So another area of research is uh, uh, designing algorithms using smallest, uh, small amounts of caches, turning off caches not being utilized so as to achieve performance goals in terms of time and power. Okay. All right, so we've seen so far, three active areas of research. One is writing multi-core codes. <clears throat> the other one is also in the multi-core area, but the focus there is in uh, changing power levels of cores, affecting the speed at which they're running, so as to overall energy uh, objectives. And the third one is uh, deciding how many blocks of cache should be used by different parts of a code so as to uh, reduce energy. All right, finally, and very briefly, I want to touch upon GPUs. Uh, they offer a different paradigm for computing than multi-cores. You have the master-slave model. So, for example, inside of a PC box, you might be able to put in four GPU boards. Uh, a quick uh, description of boards. The uh, current version of boards in the NVIDIA line would be the uh, Fermi 2050s. Uh, each board comes with 448 cores and provides about a teraflop of performance in single precision mode and half a teraflop in uh, double precision mode. These uh, processes are organized in, into uh, a number of multiprocessors. Each multiprocessor contains some number of cores. In the older versions, the 1060s, each multiprocessor had 30 cores. In the newer versions, each multiprocessor has 14 cores. The newer version has uh, 32 multiprocessors, so 32 times 14 to give us the total number of cores. The older versions had eight multiprocessors times 30 to get the 240 cores. The newer version has L2 cache and a shared L1 cache for each block of processors or each multiprocessor. The older version didn't have caches. Okay. <coughs> the uh, computing paradigm is very different than from multi-cores. You have a master code running on your C CPU, the master code at times would invoke kernels that are going to run on the GPU, and so the master code has to explicitly move data from CPU memory to GPU memory, bring the results back after the GPU is done computing. So programming here is somewhat more complex. The uh, simplistic uh, OpenMP in introduction of instructions or compiler directives doesn't work here. You have to retool the whole code. Okay, let me skip this slide. <coughs> Go and take a look at our matrix multiply kernel. <coughs> so a, a simple GPU 
code to do matrix multiply. Here, uh, <coughs> each thread would need to determine. Well, let me back up a bit. Each I'm I'm going to have one thread compute one element of the C matrix, the product matrix. So here, a thread would have to determine which element of the result matrix that is computing. Once it's determined that, so that's been done in the first two lines here, <coughs> it determines the IJ, the index of the uh, C matrix it's going to compute. And then down below here, we have the code to compute that C element. Now this is, <coughs> the, the, the last five lines are very similar to what you would see in a single core code is the first two lines that the programmer has to figure out how is a thread going to figure out which elements are going to compute. Okay, still it's not a whole lot of work to go from a single core code to this uh, GPU kernel. The uh, kernel at one thread per element requires a uh, fairly substantial number of threads. So if you're doing a multiply with n being a thousand, You can generate codes that require millions of threads without too much intellectual capital being invested. Because as we saw earlier, if you're trying to get good performance out of machines like the Tiana one a we need to be able to write codes that have uh, <coughs> uh, of the order of 20, 30 million threads. If you want to get good performance out of the K computer, you need to have of the order of a million threads. So you can write codes with uh, millions of threads uh, without too much intellectual capital being invested. <coughs> now, as was the case for the multi-core code, <laughs> while you can get an initial version of a multi-core code from a single core code by putting in simple compiler directives and you can get an initial version of a GPU code fairly simply to get the best known codes you have to put in a lot more effort. So for the GPU version for example in the case of matrix multiply the previous slide showed a code that perhaps had about seven lines in it but to get a really good GPU code, you need about 50 lines <coughs> of coding. Substantial growth in the size of your program. <coughs> what, what do you get by putting in the effort to go from that, uh, <coughs> say from a single core code to a very efficient GPU code? So I've got times here shown for the older version of NVIDIA's GPU, the 1060s. So here, everything is normalized with respect to the single core code, which is the first version of the code I showed up, the cache. Uh, I, I guess I should back up. The second one here is the first version of the code I showed. That was the IKJ version. Normalization has been done using the textbook code, which is at one unit, the IJK version. So as I said earlier, the cache aware code runs about eight times as fast as the textbook version. <coughs> and at the other extreme, if you go to highly optimized GPU versions, you're running at about 10,000 times as fast as the textbook version on this particular machine. The uh, multi-core, this was done on a four-core machine supporting two threads per core. The multi-core version is giving us uh, <coughs> a speed up of around 50 relative to the uh, single core IJK textbook version. Okay, all right. So <coughs> going first, say simply from not being aware of caches to a cache aware code, we're getting a speed up of a factor of eight. Taking into account multi cores, we're getting another speed up of maybe a factor of six, and then going to GPUs, there's a whopping speed up but it requires more programming effort. We need to end up, so that, okay, there you go, yeah. you got the last slide, okay. <coughs> yep. All, right. All right, so to summarize, okay. Uh, we, we need to be consciously aware that our industry is, compu is consuming a very significant amount of the world's energy supply, and that share is increasing exponentially 
as we move forward. <coughs> uh, as a result, we've become a significant contributor to pollution. We think of ourselves as a clean industry, but in fact we aren't. <coughs> uh, we need to be aware that the cost of operating computers is comparable, at least over the life of a computer, to the cost of buying the computer in the first place. <coughs> that green computing is focused on reducing the energy consumed by IAT and that that reduction can be done without sacrificing run to performance. Uh, we as scientists and engineers are well equipped for the new green computing era. Uh, we can contribute in the design of energy efficient architectures, but we also need to be aware that the Architecture is driven today by the gaming industry. The architecture of the future will not be designed specifically for specific applications, but instead scientific computing or computing in general would use whatever architecture has become popular in the consumer industry because the economics is much better out there. Many more people are willing to pay a few hundred dollars for a GPU board than are willing to pay for a CPU designed specifically to attain high performance in scientific computing. So the era which was there a couple of decades ago, people building processors just for in general purpose computing is gone. Instead, we would be figuring out how to use architectures designed for the consumer industry, whether it's for mobile phones or for computer games, how to use those to solve the more serious science problems. <coughs> Multi-core architectures, multi-threaded programming here to stay. On desktop computers, we will be talking about eight threads, 12 threads. <coughs> but if you're looking at GPUs, you're talking even today of millions of threads. Uh, we need to get used to the idea of writing efficient code with the order of millions, tens of millions of threads. <coughs> Although uh, desktop computers today are coming with four to six down the road, uh, they'll be coming with hundreds if not thousands of cores. <coughs> and as we've seen with the uh, simple view, uh, it will not be possible to take existing codes and pilot directives and get the best performance out of these uh, faulty codes. It's going to take humans rewriting these codes to get that kind of, to get anywhere near close to peak performance for these uh, new kinds of computers. And in turn, what that means is that for people who can actually write efficient codes, is going to remain strong very, very long time to come. All right, so that brings me to the end of this rather introductory talk on uh, green computing, which really is a huge motivator for multi-core, both architecture and software, both at the compiler level, operating system level. And All right, so. Uh, uh, we're pretty much at the one-hour mark. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, we, uh, we, we, we will take a few few time. Yeah, okay. All right. So let's uh, take, take a few minutes for a few questions. Uh, so let the audience kind of type in their yeah. question. Uh, sure. This is a, so right. it's a really really a stimulating um, uh, you know, so a session. Uh, I'm not a computer scientist, but I, uh, I really you know, got a good idea in general, you know, how things are going and uh, what what we're talking about. And I'm sure those who are in the computer science field must have got some excellent. Uh, ideas for you know, what are the, some of the relevant research that we need to uh, all be engaged in. Uh, as a layman, I had a quick question and so yeah, uh, some, some people in the, in the uh, audience, <coughs> so several of the attendees are, you know, are in large groups of students and so on. So one question was when you have when you, uh, the one Google search, you said is uh, seven grams of carbon dioxide and uh, 
Uh, how, how do you how do you measure that? How does that work? How, how exactly do you solve that number? Yeah, I, I, I think that's based really on uh, factoring in the energy used by all of the servers to which the thing is uh, uh, the air energy used by the air conditioning in these data centers and all of that. Ah, okay. 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 Uh, let's right. See. Right. Uh, so it is indirect because it. Uh, uh, there are emissions in the energy process. There's also <coughs> emissions from using it so you, from your computers and so on. Okay, another question from Savan Kumar is: yeah. uh, and you said in your in your slide, you said four processors at half speed uh, is more economical than one processor, and so I guess that's the, something that was confusing. But doesn't it consume more power right. from four processors you know, than one? Uh, and how? So, you, uh, um, go ahead. Yeah. All right. Let me go back to that so I can show a picture at the same time as I'm trying to explain. The okay. A very interesting thing. Yeah. Sometimes I get an hour and a half of this talk. So. Uh, <laughs> Now, yeah, we'll just wind up in a couple of minutes. So I'm sure there's a people out there who time do with how. how how we get routers are a major uh, energy hogs appointed, and the sort of work that computer scientists and engineers are doing to uh, reduce energy consumption by routers. Yeah. Right. So here I've got my four core example. <clears throat> okay. So the key is that the energy that a core takes <coughs> is a function of the speed at which it's running, but it's not a linear function. That function is somewhere between the square and the cube of the speed. So if I'm running a processor at a certain speed s, let's say it takes one unit of energy per second. If you run that processor at half the speed, so s over 2, then it's going to take 1 over 4 units of energy per second. If the relationship is quadratic, if the relationship is cubic, then at half the speed it will take 1 over 8 units of energy. If you run the processor at a speed of s over 4, then <clears throat> at a quadratic relationship, it would take 1 16th the energy. With a cubic relationship, it would take 1 over 64th the energy. Okay. So now, here on the left, I've got a computation which says all cores are running at the same speed, s. So <clears throat> the, the red core is going to run for only two units of time. And then we shut it off because it's done its works, or maybe it goes into sleep mode. So that takes you two units of energy, one unit of energy per unit of time. The two yellow cores take four units of time each at one unit of energy per time. So that's four units of energy per each of the yellow cores. And then uh, I've got my black core, which is going to run for eight units of time, taking eight units of energy. So if you add them up, you get 18 units of energy consumed across the four cores. Here in the green box, <clears throat> I've got my red core running at one-fourth the speed. So at one-fourth the speed, it would take eight units of time. It was taking two units of time at full speed, at one-fourth, eight units of time. But per unit of time, it's taking one over 16 units of energy. So the first term here is eight times one over 16. The two yellowish ones, <clears throat> are also going to take eight units of time to finish because they're running at half the speed. At full speed, it was four units. So at half speed, it's eight units of time each. But at half speed, they're taking one-fourth the energy per unit of time. So they're contributing eight times one over four each. And then the black core is running at full speed, so one unit of energy per time. It takes eight units of time, so that's eight times one. <clears throat> so if you do the math, that works out to 12 and a half units of energy. So I've got about a 30% reduction in energy from the version on the left to the green version of the right. But I have no increase in runtime because each of the four tasks is now finishing after eight units of time. And the overall block of computing, in any case, was going to take eight units of time because the, so the slowest task was going to take eight. <clears throat> so by slowing down my cores, I can achieve energy reduction. 
the reduction would be a lot more than 30% if the cores are operating at a range where the relationship between speed and energy is cubic or somewhere in the middle where it may be um, two, uh, two and a half, 2.5. Okay. <clears throat> so as I said, this introduces a very interesting area of research. You take the task graph for a complex program and you want to schedule it <coughs> not in the old traditional sense where you had no control over how long each task takes. So now you're going to schedule the tasks in different cores, but you have the freedom to select from a set of speeds at which the core can run, thereby affecting the time at which each task will finish. So I want to select the speeds for the cores per task on a per task basis so that the overall job, programming job, finishes in a specified amount of time. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, there's another comment <coughs> related to this. Deepak you know, says, what if we use some of these cores serially and synchronize it to the first <coughs> core while shutting down the leftover cores? I mean, I, I'm just reading it. I don't understand it. But do, do you want to respond to that? Or there's another one by Sahil. says that the result or the intermediate of the uh, task is used elsewhere, then how can we slow down the task speed? Uh, <coughs> well, any of those? Make, right. Uh, so. Advantage? Uh, addressing the second one first, okay. the, the, the uh, task graph that is shown here okay, has taken a large computing job and broken it up into tasks in such a way that the intermediate results from the tasks are not being used. So, uh, so this red task, for example, from start to finish, it does what it has to do without communicating with any other task. <coughs> If it turns out that the red task actually has to take the results at its midpoint and share them with somebody else, then we will split the red task into two subtasks and put a node in between. Okay. <clears throat> so the, de the decomposition of a programming job into tasks is done in such a way <clears throat> that the decomposed tasks never communicate with anybody else. And so the uh, scenario that uh, uh, you, you posed doesn't arise. Okay, that's handled at the task decomposition time. Okay. <clears throat> now the <clears throat> the other one. Well, what if you uh, instead took some of these multi-cores and you pipeline them? Okay. <clears throat> now you, you you can certainly do that. Okay. There's nothing in the programming model that prevents you from <clears throat> uh, from doing that. So you could take a larger program and break it up into serial tasks so that one core does the first part of this, the first task in the series, the next core does the next task, and you're running in a pipeline manner. <coughs> and so <coughs> uh, you, you could do that and you can have a combination where you have multiple, you've, you've taken your cores and broken them into multiple pipelines. <coughs> and in fact, at this very moment, uh, one of the uh, uh, research problems I'm looking at on a GPU, we, we are doing that. We're taking the uh, 448 cores we have on our GPU, and we're taking chunks of these. So each multiprocessor in the GPU that has 30 cores, the 30 cores are running in parallel, but we have a pipeline of 14 of these multiprocessors. So the first 30 <coughs> cores in this pipeline do some work. They send their result to the next multiprocessor in the pipeline. And then once they have sent their results, they continue with the next portion of the code. So you could certainly do that. And for some applications, that would give you better results than trying to run all of your cores strictly in a, <coughs> a parallel independent mode. So, so figuring out the uh, best uh, way to map an application to a multi-core uh, would involve uh, deciding how you break down the tasks into uh, what you might think of as a series parallel graph of tasks and then executing them. Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I guess somebody just had a suggestion. Perhaps all the data centers should move to hill stations. Would that cut down, <laughs> cut down the energy? <laughs> uh, well, it, it, it certainly would. <clears throat> okay. In, in, in fact, uh, what, what one of the primary considerations in locating a data center is, uh, is energy. In fact, I said that is the primary consideration, is the cost of energy. And so, <clears throat> Uh, you, you may, for example, locate an energy center near a river, so you have uh, quick access to uh, relatively cool water that could be used to water cool uh, your, your whole data center. Or uh, uh, one of the examples I had where uh, you know they, they wanted the data center in a particular state, they, they went and found a mountain which is made of limestone, it's easy to carve into, and you bury it inside the mountain. Okay. Other places would dig into the ground and maybe put a data center, say, more than eight feet below the surface of the mm -hmm. ground where the ambient temperature remains the same year round. And certainly you could put it in a hill station where it doesn't get too hot, so your air conditioning costs are reduced in, by a significant amount. So that, that is uh, very much true. That's a suggestion that people are actually uh, employing. Uh -huh. but yeah. That was Abhijat Kumar uh, who made that uh, comment. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's it's a very good it's a very good uh, <coughs> suggestion, one that is obviously commercially viable and is being done in practice. Excellent. One last uh, comment. I uh, guess more like uh, this is from Venkat who says, "There's uh, is there something called uh, something called so any software for green computing?" Uh, is, that, <coughs> is, that, is there something in that area? I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. Would you say that there is software available for green computing, or is it a lot of research involved? In that right now? Well, uh, <coughs> what is available, of course, is you have tools that would help you design applications, application software. <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, so for example, as I said, uh, you have OpenMP. So you could just put in uh, compiler directives into code, and the compiler would generate multi-core code for you. It may not be the best, but it will at least get you to use a four-core <coughs> or an eight-core processor rather than just using one of the four or eight cores that are there on what you buy. Okay. Uh, <coughs> there are uh, uh, high-level language support. For example, you know, if you were trying to do GPU computing uh, even five, six, ten years ago, it, it was very onerous because everything had to be mapped into graphics operations. Since the, those boards were built for uh, graphics, computer graphics, they were built for the gaming industry, there was no thought given into having high-level programming support for non-graphics applications. Uh, today you have languages like CUDA, which are really C-type languages, so you can write your GPU codes using a language you're familiar with <coughs> and that has had a huge impact on moving GPUs which were built for supporting computer games and uh, displays, <coughs> displaying uh, moving objects on uh, computer monitors <coughs> into the realm of scientific or high performance computing. <coughs> so you do have high, lang high level language support you have the ability to put in compiler directives and so on. <coughs> you even can go out today and you can buy an energy monitor. So you can <coughs> plug something into the wall and plug your computer into that little box and it'll tell you how much energy your computer is using. Mm. So you, you can measure the energy used by your program. Okay. So <coughs> the tools are there, but uh, it is there, for example, right now, could you go and buy, say, a green version of MATLAB? Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're there yet. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it, it's a great area for research. A number of conferences have sprung up. I think the first conference in this area maybe started uh, one year, two years ago. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> for the software types, there's... Uh, <coughs> 
you know, the possibilities are infinite. Mm -hmm. Almost all of the codes out there are going to get no benefit from e even the uh, computers that are being marketed today. So you go and you buy a four-core uh, uh, four desktop, <coughs> but people are running programs that were written five years or ten years ago when you only had single core machines. Yeah. <coughs> well, those programs are running only on one of the four cores on the desktop they have. <coughs> In the past, <coughs> you bought a new computer, well, it was running at three gigahertz instead of your previous one that was running at two gigahertz, say. <coughs> you immediately saw a speed up using that old code. Well, now, when you go to buy a new machine, well, you had a one core machine four years ago, Today you have a four-core machine. <clears throat> you run your old code; it's running slower because the four-core machine is not running at three gigahertz. It's running at a lower clock rate. <clears throat> if you want to get an improvement in your performance, which this four-core is capable of doing, well, you got to go hire an IT guy and tell him to multi-core that code. Okay. <clears throat> and it's not a trivial task. So, uh, so I think we need to, you know, close. Uh, you know, I'm really thank you very much. We still have a lot of attendees, and and those, if you have any questions, I'm. Do you mind if I give them your email ID? Which is <coughs> no, no, that's fine. That's fine. I'm happy to entertain emails. Yeah, yeah. it's s a h n i dot s a r t a j sani dot sultaj at gmail dot com. Repeat that again: s a h n i dot s a r t a j at gmail.com and uh, thank you so much uh, Sata. this has been a fantastic uh, <coughs> webinar and I'm sure a lot of people have learned a lot from it and will be motivated to, to work in this direction which is very very critical uh, so uh, that's it okay okay well thanks a lot Krishna thank for you. the opportunity and I'd like to thank the audience for uh, being there okay thank thanks you. everybody yeah thanks thank you